Um, basically, uh, well, welcome everybody. We're going to give everybody a chance to get us caught up on uh, what's going on in your, your part of the world. It's so good to see your faces again. Um, we just wanted to provide this opportunity to check in with uh, different groups, past groups of the Center for Protected Area Management, uh, together with the Forest Service that uh, offered the, this seminar and all of our other seminars. We're just trying to provide this opportunity to strengthen our network, check in with everybody, see how everybody's doing, get, a, get an update on, on how people are, are weathering through this storm, how they're, how they're getting creative and trying to think of new ways forward uh professionally but also just personally provide this space for us all to check in with each other and so um thanks for 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 joining i know it's hard you know to get people from all across the globe to be able to be uh together in the same space at the same time but we thank you all for for being here and and um i think aaron's just going to give us a quick uh i know as time goes on, we're more and more specialists on uh, using all these different online platforms. So there's not as much of a need to go over the, the, the details on how to do the Zoom. But uh, anyways, Erin? Yes, thank you, Ryan. And it's so good to see everybody. Um, we don't have a large group. Maybe some other people will join us later. But this is more just to uh, create some order in case uh, we have a large group and everyone wants to talk at once. Um, but uh, just to quickly go over, there is a chat uh, feature and uh, feel free to use that to share anything or um, write any questions. There is the opportunity to raise your hand, but you could also just turn on your mic and, and, and speak um, since we don't have a large group. Um, if we find that the connection is slow, we may ask you to turn off your videos, but hopefully we'll be able to see our beautiful faces as we converse today. And, uh, we kindly ask you to keep your microphone muted when you are not speaking so that we don't have too much background noise. So with that, we just basically want to do go around and uh, have everybody provide us with a brief update on on how things are going on your end, uh, both personally, how you're dealing with uh, the current situation, the current crisis but also institutionally, how, how, how things are going. And so why don't we go ahead and start with, uh, with Cristiano. Mute. Okay, now. Hi, everyone. Uh, in Brazil, we, we are facing all this pandemic season uh, with uh, different uh, feelings because uh, uh, a small part of the population are facing this like uh, uh, it's not it's not uh, um, facing that so uh, seriously so uh, people th these people go to the streets and do the, the things normally but uh, we uh, uh, I particularly, I am in home office since March and uh, working normally, but uh, at home. Uh, it's not uh, so easy, but uh, I, I'm okay. <laughs> And uh, what else do you, do you want to know? We, that's, that's a good overview. We can start there. And we're, we're going to have a couple of just more specific questions that we'll get to later on. So thanks, uh, Cristiano, for that update. Um, maybe now let's go to Silvia. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, great. Good morning. Good morning for us. Good Thanks evening for you. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you too. Very, very happy actually to see you guys together. Uh, in my country, uh, we are um, so we come to an end because our government is some new conversations. Uh, but still, I am working from home personally. I've been doing that since 11, the 11th of March when the um, first case was confirmed in the first infection. So, 
quite a quick response. Uh, Sylvia, sorry to interrupt. You're breaking up a little. Maybe try with your video off just to see if that helps with the audio. Okay. Okay, I hope this helps. And indeed, my internet connection is quite, is not that good here. Um, but still, if in case I, uh, you missed something, what I said, so my organization had a quick response. Taking into consideration, I use the public. Yes? You're still breaking up. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's not your fault. This, this, this has <laughs> happened every webinar. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we all try just turning our videos off and seeing if that helps. And then let me check a bit in case. Yeah, check your. I, yeah, I think now should be better. So far, you sound good right now. Okay. Okay, try again. So basically. <laughs> Okay. okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, perhaps um, perhaps I will add the um, um, further. I think um, yeah. Try try again and and let's see how it goes. And if not, you could type something in the chat and and check your internet connection. But we want to hear from you. So let's see let's see if it works this time. Yeah, so in case I'm still breaking up, up um, perhaps it's with someone else wants to add something and perhaps I will join further after that. So far you're clear right now. Yeah, okay, I'm glad. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, let me see where I, where I stopped. So basically in this time, of lockdown um i was able a bit partially to continue my field work um but not everywhere i wanted because we were forbidden to visit protected areas and forests and in my in in, in my country the majority of protected areas are actually forests um so i was able just to sneak a bit and to continue my work so that it won't won't totally lack any information any vital information but otherwise i was just working from home so basically that's it okay thank you sylvia and and welcome to uh another group of people that i've seen have joined since uh since we started i see uh, Donnie has joined us, and Itzel has joined us, and Sadao has joined us as well. So uh, we're going to keep going through right now, everybody, just as a quick update. Um, everybody's just providing a brief introduction, a brief overview of how they're doing, how their institution is doing during these unusual COVID times. And I'll just call you one by one to have you do that presentation. And from there, we'll move into some more specific uh, reflection questions that we can dive a little bit deeper on how people are adapting and getting creative. And more than anything, we're just here to provide support to each other during these uh, interesting and challenging times. So let's let, now let's go to Moira. Hi, everybody. Um, so for me, well, it's pretty much the same as all over the world. I'm working from home since March 13th. Um, in Croatia, generally, now things are going quite well regarding the COVID-19 situation. In the last couple of days, we had like zero new cases, which is good. But what is bad is that we are like highly dependent of, on tourism and this will affect many workplaces and people income and things like that. I mean, this will be pretty huge for the whole country so we'll see how will this summer season go for us uh, personally um, so since i transferred to work for university um, i mean everything is going quite well we switched to do everything online and this works out perfectly 
and regarding the protected areas uh, they were closed for almost two months and recently they reopened but people are slowly coming back i mean still we don't have that many people coming outside of the country to croatia but they started let's say this last week maybe we had some tourists from neighboring countries coming the people that can come with their cars let's say like that so we are slowly starting to return to let's say the new normal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but slowly <laughs> yeah great well thank you moira for that uh, yeah. for that for that update and and also we since since you left us a few years ago we congratulate you on that transition also from the parks to the, to the university thanks. job thanks. um let's let's now hear from donny And welcome, Walter. Before we're waiting for Donny to turn his uh, microphone off of mute, we just wanted to welcome Walter. Uh, glad you could join us. We'll get to you in just a minute. We're just going around and everybody's doing brief introductions. So, Donny, you're up. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, no. No. Uh, no. 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 In COVID nineteen in Indonesia, we we have, uh, we we still uh, close the uh, ecotourism in uh, Bukit Baka Bukit Raya National Park. Oh yeah, uh, I'm now uh, I'm now working in National uh, Bukit Baka Bukit Raya National Park, not in Sebangau uh, Sebangau National Park. Ah uh, yeah. In uh, Bukit Bakar Bukit Raya, have uh, two uh, 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 two item in uh, apa pendakian uh, hiking to summit in uh, summit in Bukit Raya and in the location in the West uh, Kalimantan. And uh, number two, uh, we have uh, the area of uh, tourism in, we, we call the name uh, Wisata Alam Blaban. Uh, we have two, two points, two point interest. Uh, now, uh, because COVID, we closed uh, start in March, mm. in March uh, 22. In March, yeah, uh, yeah 2020, uh, and still now. Uh, and it's the holiday uh, uh, holiday uh, uh, holiday of Eid uh, Mubarak. Uh, usually uh, we we open, but in apa in uh, because of COVID uh, we still close. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Maybe from me. This that's all from me. Thank you. Very much. Okay, Donnie, okay, thank you. Okay, Donnie, thank you. Um, now let's go for an update to uh, Itzel. Hi, everyone. Hello. Well, hello. <laughs> um, it's very glad to, to, to see you and hear you. And well, uh, for now, um, the most of the time we're working from home. And um, we do roles with my other uh, partners in, in work for supervision and um, uh, we, we check, up, uh, check that uh, uh, illegal fish in, in natural protected area. And um, maybe we uh, work in this, in this way uh, for the next, uh, month and um, the the island is stopped uh, to tourists the cruise ships uh, will, will uh, come back uh, uh, on august and um, we, uh, we we work in in this in this way 
Okay, thank you, Itzel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now let's go to, I think, Sedao. I thought I saw Sedao just briefly come into the picture at one time. Are you there, Sedao? Maybe not. I thought that was the person registered as Kim. But let's, let, let's, um, yeah. Hi, do you listen to me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh huh. Go right ahead. I'm trying to unmute him again. Okay, I think that this is working right now. Yeah, I think it's working now. Okay. Well, hello everybody. I'm glad to see you. Well, in my case, as most of you know it, I quit my job uh, since two years ago to move to Canada with my family. And here I'm, well, I'm still learning the language because uh, I'm in, the, in Quebec, which is a province uh, whose the body speak uh, French. Eventually, I'm studying language, and probably I will like to work in the national parks still in this uh, area or natural conservation. And to, to hook concerns to my job or to my projects in Mexico, I, after, before coming to Canada, we try to open a, a small company or a small agency of tourism. But right now, how the situation is, I don't know if we are going to continue with that project. Uh, we... Oh, I can't wait a minute, please. The, the challenges of home office, as we all know. part of my full-time job. Yeah, the wonderful, the wonderful challenges. It's, yes, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> process, I think that I am asking, I asking myself, what is the best thing that I can do and take care of my kids is the, the best job I can do. Yeah. I right know. Well, th that is the situation and I will, uh, I'm going to try to continue in this, uh, in this field, mm -hmm. uh, in the natural conservation and eventually I would like to, to work here in a national park as well. Mm -hmm. well, that, that's it. Great. Thank you, uh, Sadao. Thanks for the update. Now we're going to go to my friend Walter for his update. <laughs> Walter, you're still on mute. So we can't hear you right now. Maybe Aaron could help uh, unmute Walter. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute him and it's not letting me. So, Walter, if you go down to the microphone on there the you go. Video. There you go. Am, am I better now? Yes, we can hear you can very hear clear. You. Yeah. Hi, Walter. Great, nice, uh, nice to hear you guys uh, after a long period of time, and a warm greeting from Uganda. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you are aware, I move away from my former station, that is the uh, Kidepo Valley National Park, and I'm now in Mount Elgon National Park in northeastern Uganda. Uh, we are working under the COVID situation, but uh, we are not fully locked down. For the Uganda Wildlife Authority, our activities is going on normally uh, with a lot of conservation challenges around. Um, am I clear? Yes, very clear. Great, good. Um, uh, conservation challenges that we have now here is uh, illegal activities in our protected areas. People are encroaching to dig in the, in, the, in, the, in the protected area, cutting timber and very many other things. So uh, we resorted, the organization resorted to revert most of the department being tourism, being uh, uh, research and ecological monitoring. We are now doing actual law enforcement activities in the period to maintain uh, the integrity of the protected area. However, tourism activities is closed down uh, for the time being. Uh, meanwhile, I'm trying around to organize other communities to prepare them to take up immediately after the COVID. And uh, even in the period of the COVID, we are trying to look at how to develop kind of virtual tourism so that uh, the community continue to get benefit from uh, protected area resources that they have 
so that people can be able to watch from their own places with some little bit of payment. Um, we are expanding on the community-based tourism activities, uh, uh, preparing uh, cultural villages in, the, in, in some areas where I'm working. Um, the situation is quite uh, alarming, but much more from our neighboring, neighboring countries. In Uganda itself, uh, it is not all that bad. And uh, today, there is partial uh, um, uh, acceptance for other activities like public transport. We are trying to see how it can perform. But uh, we are really very, very hopeful that things can move well. And uh, I'm really very proud that uh, the result of what we did in the Colorado in that period of time is really highly being done out, out here. And uh, over time, we shall get to share and know uh, what is happening here. I'm really happy and nice to be in touch with you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. Really appreciate the update. Um, good to hear your voice. Um, now let's go to Grace. For an update on how she's doing and, and how the Forest Service is adapting to the situation. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Uh, well, it's nice to see you all and hear from you all this morning. Um, I am doing well still here in Washington, D.C., um, but spending a lot more time in my apartment, getting to know it very well. And um, yeah, we've been working from home like everyone else uh, for the last couple of months um, and are expecting that it will probably stay that way through the summer, maybe later, um, just because there's, um, we can do our jobs from home, so no rush for us to get back. Um, but yeah, I think it'll probably affect a lot of the kind of normal program management work that I would be doing because we're not expecting to travel to visit any projects or do any um, um, like monitoring or site visits or anything like that, uh, probably for maybe another year, just depending on how things play out. Um, so yeah, it'll, it's definitely a different time, um, lots to get used to, but um, all together doing all right. And um, yeah, look forward to hearing from the rest of you. Great. Thanks, Grace. And um, we are uh, very fortunate to have such amazing partners here at Colorado State University with the U.S. Forest Service, who's um, we've been brainstorming with a lot on, on not only uh, how the Forest Service is going to be adapting, but also how programs like ours that are partners of the Forest Service are going to be adapting over the coming six months, 12 months, 18 months. Hard to know uh, what the future holds, but uh, it's good to be in this together with the Forest Service. Um, let me pass the word to Erin now for her, her update. Hi, everybody. So good to hear your voices and glad that everyone is well. I'm here at Fort Collins. Um, our whole team is working from our respective offices uh, since, since March as well and uh, still working uh, with the Center for Protected Area Management and our wonderful team and just really grateful to uh, be going through this with a, such a supportive team and family, really. Um, since uh, we've had you in Colorado, we launched a Women's Leadership and Conservation Seminar, which is our new flagship seminar. It was launched last year in Spanish. And this year we are hoping to offer, we were planning to offer in English in person, but uh, we're seeing if we could develop it for an online version so that women uh, conservation leaders from around the world can join. So we'll keep you informed. Uh, uh, our our women conservation leaders that are on this call right now, um, in case you want to participate in the future. I'm personally doing well. Um, just staying home, luckily in Colorado, there's a lot of open spaces to visit. Uh, and while we just had a holiday weekend and I heard that it was pretty crowded, uh, we luckily still get to get outside. Uh, the weather's nice, get some sunshine and just enjoy beautiful Colorado. But um, good to hear from everybody and sending hugs your way. Thanks, Aaron. <clears throat> Jim? Hello, everyone. 
it's good to see your faces and hear your voices and uh, to hear that everyone is doing well amid all this craziness. Um, uh, I got to see Itzel at her park uh, not long after she was in the seminar. I was in a uh, workshop uh, with Cuban and U.S. and Mexican colleagues on coastal zone conservation. Uh, I think of this group, um, Itzel is the only one I've seen. Uh, Moira, you know, we had 15 of your Croatian colleagues from four different parks visit us one year ago in May of last year on a custom study tour we did, modeled after the one you participated in, but only for a large group of Croatian park professionals funded by the EU. That was neat. Uh, Cristiano, Ryan and I get to, until recently, went to Brasilia regularly on one of our trips. We're going to have to uh, see if we can get together. Uh, Donnie, uh, congratulations on your new job and my condolences on the loss in that tragic boat accident of several of your friends uh, in the national park where you used to work. Uh, Sadal, wish you the best and uh, in, in Canada. And if you want, I know several of the high ranking officials of the Canadian Park Service. I'd be happy to do an introduction for you. And I also have a good friend if you're in Montreal who's a refugee from Honduras who's been through what you're going to, and I could put you in touch with him as well. And Walter, I don't know if I mentioned, congratulations on your Africa Award. Uh, you got, I think that's been about a year ago. Wonderful. He got an Africa-wide award as a leading young conservationist. So it's great to see all of you remaining active. Uh, Cristiano, it's wonderful to see how your president is in a competition with our president to see who can have the most COVID cases in the world. We're right up there at the top, number one and two. <laughs> with non-believers for presidents as well. But we wish you all the best. Uh, Ryan did mention that we've had about well over one and a half million cases in the United States. I know that sounds absurd to some of you from small countries like Moldova. And uh, today we're going to pass the figure of 100,000 people lost, which is just in 10 weeks we've lost more people than in all of our wars, and we tend to get into a lot of wars since World War II in just 10 weeks. So this is a serious issue. And it's incredible to see how some people are still not taking it uh, seriously. 11 years ago, right before I came to CSU, I got the H1N1 virus. The last time we had a global outbreak, it wasn't nearly as bad, but I got pneumonia and I was the sickest I've ever been. And I was hospitalized in Costa Rica for a while. So my wife and I are being very careful and keeping our distance, but getting out on walks and uh, using this time to catch lots of fish. I've had my best year of fishing ever. Fortunately, as I mentioned, our state parks and our local parks, they closed camping, they closed visitor centers. Any large group of people was not allowed, but they stayed open to allow people to recreate. And I think it was a really smart move. And because of that, I'm going to have fish for lunch today. Uh, we've been doing very good out on the, the local waters. So it's been great uh, um, keeping healthy. Uh, we've had to cancel not only our courses, but a lot of trips, one to Brazil, I was supposed to go to Russia uh, to get on a speaking tour last month, had to be canceled. Uh, we were all going to go to the World Conservation Congress this month and in, in our, our next month uh, in just a couple weeks in France. That's been postponed to January. So we'll see. The world has changed dramatically. A lot less travel, a lot less carbon footprint. But we're hanging in there and we're all becoming more adept at online um, education and I think some of you might have already seen, I've been in several webinars and going to be in another one in a couple of weeks with Brazilian colleagues in Portuguese. So we're trying to really keep active on the web uh, in webinars and in working with our network, our communities of practice, and helping all of us to take advantage of this lull in activity outside the house to build our own skill sets. And I hope that all of you are doing the same. Thank you very much. Great, Jim. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the update. Um, just to add uh, with to what my colleagues have already said, uh, basically, we at the center, we've canceled all of our face to face activities through the end of the year, trying to do as much as we can online. Um, obviously, it's very hard to get the experience that you see right now in that picture of bringing people from all over the world to a unusually snowy Yellowstone National Park in September through online. And so uh, obviously there is a real challenge to uh, our uh, organization and what we do and, and how we do things if 
this lockdown and close down continues uh, if, for the foreseeable future. But uh, we're uh, making plans and doing what we can online. And uh, as everybody said, uh, you know, enjoying time at home, uh, doing homeschool, doing home office, doing home everything, uh, and uh, doing all those home projects that we wanted to do that we never had time to do, and and uh, also taking advantage of uh, of, uh, of all of Colorado's natural areas uh, that we can still go out hiking and and uh, enjoying the outdoors. Um, uh, I, I've been fortunate. I've been in touch. I, I'm glad to see Cristiano and catch up with him because I've been in, in contact or interacted with or, or seen all the Brazilians uh, except for Cristiano. So at one point or another, with over since since the seminar, we've been working with Carolina and Rodrigo and Roberta and Carolina and, and Andre Cunha, but I haven't had the chance to interact with Cristiano, which is nice. Um, we've also been in touch with uh, Juan Carlos and Gabriela in, in Galapagos. Uh, as we've been working on developing a new marine protected area seminar in the Galapagos Islands. And we're hoping, we were hoping to launch that late this year, but obviously that's going to now be on hold uh, probably to late 2021 uh, to launch uh, for people working in marine protected areas, uh, a seminar that would be would take, actually not take place in the U.S., but take place in the Galapagos Islands. And so that's something that we're working on um, developing um, as well. And we'll see if that actually becomes possible or not as we go forward. But uh, overall, we're doing well and, uh, and uh, just figuring out things uh, as we go each day, day by day, like everywhere, everywhere else in the world. Um, we are going to be launching a, 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 another webinar series that's different than this. This is more of a personal check-in webinar series. But we're right now organizing with the Forest Service uh, a webinar series that's going to focus on three topics. And we're going to be giving each of those two times, one in Spanish, one in English. Uh, one is going to be on um, financial resilience for protected areas in the post-COVID-19 world. One is going to be about restarting sustainable tourism uh, in, in the COVID world, where we're kind of hopefully bringing bringing together lots of information from different organizations and parks that have started to reopen and kind of uh, figuring out what's working and what doesn't work. And then the other one is going to be about part, the role of the park ranger and kind of front lines workers uh, for protected areas during, during this time. And so um, be on the lookout for that. We'll be sending you uh, updated information about those webinars once we launch them uh, in, in June. So with that, um, we just wanted to uh, continue the conversation. I'm just checking here, making sure I think we've hit everybody that's on the call. And um, we're just interested in, in diving a little deeper for anybody that would like to share um, information about um, how, how things are working. We've, kind of, we've hit number one uh, here on the screen through the introductions. But um, as Aaron already mentioned, you know, we had planned to offer the second edition of our Women's Leadership Seminar uh, in person for women leaders from all around the world this October. And we're rapidly trying to figure out how to adapt that to be just an online uh, seminar. And so there's lots of you know, opportunities or creative ideas where we can try to adjust what we do. Obviously, there's limits to that because uh, you know, it's the, it, the Online is very, is very, very different than face to face, but we are all trying to get creative to figure out how to stay afloat, especially with organizations like ours or NGOs that don't depend on, on government funding and need, need to raise their own funds. You have to be creative. So I was just curious uh, if anybody out there has any uh, creative ideas that they're, they've been working on uh, that they'd like to share that's uh, working for them uh, during these COVID times. And feel free to unmute yourself if you would like to speak or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. Maybe we see people again. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we can try. Yeah. Let's, why don't we try again? I, I, I with the, this is better. Yeah, we can try again and see how the, uh, how the um, bandwidth holds up. So if you want to turn on your videos, we can give it a try. One of the things, I, I'll just add one of the things I saw that uh, was really interesting in California, the state of California, um, they have a, um, a, uh, an organization that's a branch of the state park system that uh, basically saw, you know, all, all the state parks were closed in California for months are still for the most part closed. They may be having a slow reopening, 
uh, soon, but all the kids were at home, um, you know, trying to do homeschool and teachers were, weren't sure what to do and parents were pulling their hair out, not, not knowing how to work at the same time they're trying to teach their kids all of a sudden, especially with the little kids, you know, older kids are able to kind of do that homeschooling a little bit easier. And so the state of California created virtual field trips to all of their state parks. And so this obviously was beneficial for people with internet access. It didn't support those that didn't have internet access, but um, uh, it was a nice way for the parks to be able to reach out not only to the students of their state, but also to people all around the country and the world that wanted to maybe take a virtual tour through a California state park. And so it was, a, it was actually a unique opportunity to engage with a new audience and bring people into the park to provide support to teachers, to provide support to parents, and get kids thinking about the environment at the same time. Um, so, you know, there, there are creative things that, that I've seen people are doing and, and you know, to, com to combine with that, um, you know, you have certain areas, certain communities, certain cities that don't have very good internet access or no internet access. And so one of the things that I thought was also neat was com combining those kinds of things, uh, uh, developing new virtual tours to state parks with using school buses. Here, here typically we have, you know, school buses that will pick the kids up and bring them to school. And they were uh, outfitting the school buses with uh, wireless internet transmitters, driving those school buses and then parking them in neighborhoods that didn't have internet access so they could emit free internet into those communities. So just some creative ways that uh, people were trying to adapt in these unusual times. Any other ideas or thoughts that people have on uh, maybe things you're doing yourself or other creative ideas you've seen people, people trying out? Uh, yeah, I've seen people uh, doing uh, events, big events, uh, virtually, and that's very, very good. Not uh, uh, related to um, protected areas, but uh, I, I believe it, it can help if we we need. Um, uh, I I can see people doing uh, a lot of lives. <laughs> And but but doing business uh, virtually and it's it's very uh, very good. It's a good uh, idea to to put um, the two operators um, together with uh, uh, local people. And, uh, that's very very good for for me. And I can see some marketplaces. Uh, Increasing to uh, because of the the, the the season, and I can see people learning how to to use all these gadgets, this virtual uh, how how to live virtually, and uh, I believe uh, after the the COVID we will have uh, uh, in Ministry of Tourism we will have uh, more virtual meetings and. Uh, uh, that's for me. It's good because it helps to 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 it helps it helps to 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 put people closer to personal. Thanks, Cristiano. Any other thoughts or ideas? We our, our local national, I mean, we mentioned that many of our state and municipal protected areas have remained open and the trails are open. Uh, mo you know, all the visitor centers are closed. Many of the bathrooms are closed. The interpretive programs are closed. Anything that would have a larger group gathering still largely remains closed. But uh, some of the bigger national parks that draw people in from all over the country, like Rocky Mountain National Park here, right near Fort Collins has been closed but they're looking at reopening here, I think later this week. And um, they're all of a sudden trying to think creatively about how to handle what's probably gonna be a very high demand for visitation. And um, this time of year, it already can be very, very busy. And so they're looking at the possibility of uh, doing uh, 
an online reservation system. So if you want to visit Rocky Mountain National Park next Saturday, you have to actually fill out an online application form that will say, okay, you can, you can visit the park next Saturday, but you can only enter the park at 2 p.m. And so everybody gets like a timed, not only a specific date that you can go into the park, but also at what time, uh, a window of time that you're allowed to enter the park. And they're trying to reduce the overall visitation to about 40% of what the regular visitation was to pre prevent some of the, the congestion that could be happening at the trailheads and things like that. It's just an experiment. Actually here, because access to public lands is, is uh, is almost a given because we're all paying taxes and the taxes go to support these public lands. Um, right now, this is just a proposal that the Park Service has made to our Department of Interior, but it has to be approved before the park can actually restrict access to the park through this measure. But uh, it's just one idea, I think, that many different um, national forests and national parks and wildlife refuges are gonna be dealing with trying to figure out how to reopen slowly and uh, doing so in a way that makes people feel comfortable, but also is, you know, is, uh, is scientifically sound. Does anybody out there uh, have, it sounds like with Walter uh, or others, where you have protected areas that have remained open, but maybe have adjusted some uh, measures like sanitation measures or distancing measures or using face, face coverings, um, that have that have, that have happened throughout this pandemic. Anybody have examples of of how their protected areas have been adapting to visitation? Well, uh, in Croatia, for example, I mean, parks were closed for two months, but now they started reopening, and they they do actually take a lot less people now they have limitations but for example for Briony national park it, i mean it's easy because it's an island and the only way to get there is by a boat so they for them it's easy to limit number of people they will get for others it's a bit more difficult but but yes they, they do take a lot less people now and uh, i mean these social distancing rules they still apply everywhere even though we are trying to get um to, to get back to a normal life, but still everybody is saying that, like if you have to be uh, this much apart, if you if you can, I mean it's advice you wear a mask and things like that. But uh, now since uh, we are starting to get better numbers in the um, uh, better num I mean in the meaning that we don't have that many cases anymore, people are immediately start, starting to feel safer and maybe not applying these rules as much as before. I mean, this goes very, very quickly. We forget what we were doing a month ago, but still, I mean, on TV, we get the advertisements like you have to wash your hands, you have to be apart, you have to wear masks. I mean, you don't have to, but they advise you to, mm -hmm. to do all these things. So yeah, it's, in place all these rules yeah it's it's hard sometimes with the, you know depending on how the trails are designed and this mm -hmm. you know it, it, it's we all know about social distancing we all know we're supposed to be practicing social distancing but then when you actually get out on the trails you realize very quickly that social distancing at two meters is actually impossible in most trails. So yeah, it uh, becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, we, I definitely saw that this weekend on, on some of the trails here in Fort Collins that uh, there was just too many people for the space. So it's, it's gonna be interesting to see if, you know, I know some places are, are that used to have um, um, trail, you know, out and back trails so you can go out up up the hill one way and come back the same way are trying to figure out ways to redesign trail systems so they're just uh, unidirectional, so loop trails. So, and you're forced to go, I know uh, Croatia has already ha had experience with this and, and we've learned from Croatia over the years that at places like Plitvizka's Lake National Park where there's so much traffic that you have to have the traffic moving in one direction and, and looping yeah. around or else there's no way to come back. And I think many other places are now looking at that as well. Mm, that's true. 
And also when we, we started getting these restrictions and when they close, for example, coffee shops and other shops and like uh, malls and everywhere where people used to go, all of a sudden everybody remembered, oh, we can go to the forest. <laughs> and so, for example, every day I go and walk my dog, there is a forest close to my house and usually nobody is there. But during COVID, like everybody remembered <laughs> we have a forest. <laughs> yes. So it's per, it is presenting us with unique opportunities to connect a larger percentage of the public with the natural areas. And, and hopefully there is um, a spike or an increase in uh, recognition of the importance that nature provides to all of us for our mental health as well as our physical health. And hopefully we can use that momentum to, um, to garner additional public support, and uh, what I think one of the things we're realizing here in the U.S. and I'm sure elsewhere around the world as well is that when larger percentages of the public wants to be outside and in nature all the time, we don't have enough protected areas. We need more designations. We need more space. And we're especially seeing that um, division, I think, um, uh, between the urban and rural divide we have in the United States and needing more public uh, areas, more uh, protected areas in, uh, inside the urban core and out, you know, right at the outskirts of our urban areas so that um, our larger populations that live in urban areas have greater access to nature. And so hopefully there's going to be uh, more opportunities there to be thinking about how, how to do that, especially with areas that are rapidly urbanizing, uh, at least around the outskirts, trying to create more green space. And um, so that as those cities grow, there's, there's more, more green space uh, included in, in, those, in those areas. Um, I, I'm cur Walter, uh, I'm, I'm curious if you're still there and can, and can come back live uh, and talk to us a little bit. Um, is there absolutely no visitation that's happening um, in, in your, in your protected area or in Uganda? Has all visitation stopped or is there some uh, local visitation happening or neighboring country visitation? Uh, what, what is the visitation situation in, in Uganda? Uh, there has been uh, uh, a total uh, uh, lockdown on the visitation. Currently, mm. we do not have visitors into our protected areas. Uh, a little bit suspended, and um, we believe uh, things will be better soon. But uh, however, we are concentrating on maintenance of our trails and uh, improving our tourism products, such that uh, maybe when the situation improves, we are able to come up with a product that can uh, compete with the rest of the world. We are highly sure that uh, there will be a lot of. Uh, caution and uh, people may fear to travel and there's not be kind of restriction. Maybe so there are some other conditions that we must have to put it right, uh, such that when visitors are here, they are clear of the, of the uh, hygiene and all these things now what uh, we are basically working on. Mm. Um, uh, the most important thing is now that uh, also that we got from our experience here on management and wildlife is, uh, is uh, the aspect of a human wildlife conflict. Uh, and uh, management of illegal activities outside protected areas. Mm -hmm. uh, Uganda, we have got wildlife uh, that spread all over in the public land, in the community land, but the law provides that uh, it is the, is the government or the Uganda Wildlife Authority to do this management. But with this lockdown, we are unable to do adequate work. So what we are trying to look toward now is that to empower the local communities to manage those challenges by themselves. So we are establishing, we are recruiting and equipping community wildlife scouts uh, that will be able to drive elephants, drive buffaloes away from their, gar <coughs> from their gardens uh, at their own will instead of the rangers running away, running up and down from other areas. And uh, we also look at that uh, there are some other legal trade uh, in wildlife product, poaching is going on, but we are unable to be all over. So uh, we are looking at that. This approach uh, uh, seems to be working well because it has produced quite a number of uh, positive results. And uh, maybe we may even, add the, the government may end up promoting it after the COVID. So uh, we are so much on uh, empowering community to participate in wildlife management outside protected area. And uh, also in my protected area here, there'd been, um, conflicts over boundary of the protected areas. The farmers 
one pieces of land inside the park to cultivate and uh, they normally sneak in. So we had been creating a, a management committee which is composed of community leaders, the youth, women, and, uh, and elders. And uh, actually they have shown that it is really possible. They are able to stop their own people much more better than when we are there by ourselves trying to impose on law enforcement. So these are kind of opportunities that the COVID has brought out and uh, we are really seeing that uh, it may help us to change our policy with time. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that update. That's, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think you've kind of started to uh, lead us into this, this last kind of question that we've been thinking a lot about here is um, just about uh, how you build resilience at multiple levels. And, and um, I think a lot of the communities that live in and near protected areas that have given up their traditional economic activities in favor of just uh, tourism as their livelihood activity are ones that are suffering the most. And so thinking about the diversification of, of communities and income opportunities, um, you know, I was unfortunate that uh, Juan Carlos and Gabriela couldn't join us because like Galapagos is one of those examples. Like Galapagos' economy, 90% of the, Galap the economy of Galapagos depends on tourism. And so, they really are struggling right now to figure out how, how to move forward. And, and what's tourism in the Galapagos? It's cruise tourism. And so, you know, it's, it's a real challenge to think about how that is going to open back up with obviously cruise ships being such a tight uh, place. So I, I'm, I'm kind of curious, Itzel, if you might chime in a little bit here and just let us know what, 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 the future looking like for Cozumel, which also is, you know, so much of the, the, the economy in Cozumel is dependent on, on cruise ship tourism and tourism in general. I'm sure it's having a huge impact, a huge effect right now on local communities. What's, what's the outlook? What, what, do you, what, what are you guys thinking about there for the future of Cozumel? Well, the people is waiting for cruise ship. Um, uh, the, 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 the people's uh, follow in the same tourists. Um, uh, we working in the past a lot of uh, in, in diversity uh, um, activities, but um, the people, um, the, 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 the tourism industry uh, um, trust in, in crochet. And um, the, the last year we made a, a study uh, um, factibility study uh, for trail in natural protected area, and the results is that the um, the, the people who come in, in cruise ship don't have to don't have time to to work in in in, in natural protected. Uh, so maybe COVID uh, uh, um, is a is a opportunity to reflect and and think in another uh, um, way to do tourism in Cozumel. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I know from some of the conversations that we've been uh, participating in with uh, people around the world, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the fact that you know, international tourism is probably going to be the last that rebounds. This idea of people traveling all the way around the world to go visit some faraway destination, even though we all really right now want to travel because we've been in quarantine in our home and we, we, we have uh, big dreams and uh, about where we might travel someday. That's probably going to take a little longer to, 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 to get back to where to some new normal. And so rethinking a little bit the tourism opportunities for very local based tourism for state or provincial tourism for national tourism and even regional tourism in, in your area you know as things start to open back up those kind of local scale tourism might rebound more quickly than this big international tourism and and we'll see you know august is where they're talking about a lot of these cruise ships getting back up and operating and it's going to be interesting to see how 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 um how interested people are on, on going on those trips and, you know, are people, is there a, a, res, uh, a residual fear, you know, and that, that's some, one of the things that we're even thinking about with our programs in the programs that we run with the forest service is that even if things start to get better, substantially better in six months, eight months, 12 months, um, is there going to be a residual feeling about people not wanting to travel around the world to not want to get on an airplane for, 
you know, eight hours, six hours, 10 hours to travel. And, and um, you know, that those kinds of activities might take a little longer, which I, I think, you know, Grace kind of hinted at the Forest Service is looking at maybe, you know, maybe a, a year or more before they, she gets back into some of her international um, activities. And we're very much looking at the same, um, just trying to plan conservatively, um, because it's, you know, living in a constant space of uncertainty is so challenging, you know. Are we going to open tomorrow? Are we going to open next week? Are we going to mm-hmm. open? You know, it's kind of hard for you to be able to plan your day-to-day and, and, and get a vision when, you, when we're planning in such short time frames with so much, so much uncertainty. Um, any, are there any other um, things that people are thinking about in terms of resilience? I mean, obviously... Um, when we think of resilience, a lot of times we think of, of financial resilience and um, just knowing that uh, visitor numbers and visitation patterns are likely going to change uh, the effects to local businesses. There's going to be some local businesses that go, that go away, that, that can't survive. And um, are, are anybody else thinking about uh, resil- how to build in that financial resilience? I mean, um, at, at different destinations around the world. I, I wonder, Cristiano, from, uh, from, from, from the Ministry of Tourism perspective, are, are you guys approaching this topic of, uh, of uh, economic resilience for some of these uh, tourism sites in Brazil? Yeah, we, we are facing this problem, I believe, all over the world. But here, uh, local businesses are, are closing. Um, because of that, uh, our president, says that we, 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 we don't need uh, the, the lockdown because uh, he is concerned about the economy, just like uh, your president, Ryan, and, and Jim, that uh, says, uh, well, uh, a lot of local business, business are is closing. The government is trying to, to provide uh, credit to entrepreneurs. So that business can overcome the, the crisis. Uh, Ministry of Tourism has um, get the, the got the a big plant of credit to to give people uh, to to the, the entrepreneurs, but uh, it's it's hard to to discredit. Um, to, to find the, 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 the people that really need it because sometimes uh, these local business they, they don't have uh, um, they don't have guarantees to, to, to have this credit so you know it's difficult and nine percent of our uh, of our um, enterprises in Brazil that works with tourism it's uh, uh, small, our, our local business, our, our small business. So it, it's hard to them to to take the, the, this credit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge. We we are seeing um, traditional restaurants, uh, even in Brazil, uh, uh, closing, and uh, that will be a, 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 a big challenge to us to to overcome after the, the COVID time. And we, we are seeing the same, uh, no, uh, no long travels in the next uh, year. And after we believe we will have the, the international travels again, but not, uh, not for now. So we are, we are looking at we we are looking for the inbound tourism because it's what what we we have now. Mm-hmm. Jim, I, you've been involved in a lot of uh, webinars and conversations recently. I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, Jim. I wonder if you might join in with some of your thoughts, overall thoughts and comments ab- about this. First of all, uh, for those of you who may not even notice, there's a chat function. In that chat box, I put a couple of links. One was to a webinar that I did with the IUCN Tapas Group on Tourism and Protected Areas a couple of weeks ago, together with my colleague, Dr. Paul Eagles of Canada, who was one of the co-authors of the original IUCN guide 
Institute on Tourism and Protect Area. He's very well known around the world. He's authored a lot of books on uh, uh, concessions and papers on public use and protected areas. So I recommend you go. I, la I love two different links. Uh, one of them is a Facebook link. The other is a YouTube link. And in that, I focus a lot more on institutional and financial security for protected areas in the post-COVID world. Paul talks more specifically about his opposition to what Canada did, which was close even local parks. And it really affected people's ability to get out and recreate. Uh, I also put a link in there to something sent me uh, from IUCN, which it's about three weeks old now, but it's a, just a huge list of different references on sanitation, on wildlife, on lots of different links between protected areas and COVID. Uh, the situation obviously is evolving daily, but I do recommend that you use this time to participate in as many webinars as you can to keep up to date and to prepare to build resilience to your protected areas. I see Itzel on the screen and you know she's a good example. Her area already went through this 11 years ago. When the H1N1 virus, the one that put me in the hospital happened, it started in Mexico. And Mexico got a very bad reputation very quickly. And I was working a lot near Itzel's Park at that time. And I'll never forget about a month after this hit, getting off an airplane in uh, Cancun and seeing a line of over a hundred taxis with the drivers with just their arms crossed with no, no work at all. So some of our parks have been through this with different, with natural disasters, economic crises before. So let's learn the lessons. Let's remember the lessons from the last time around. And I think one of the key ones is that people are probably for a long period of time going to uh, change their, their recreational patterns, doing already in the United States, some colleagues of Ryan and mine that used to be from our university now at Penn State, did a study where people are recreating closer to home in smaller groups, they're preferring auto travel to plane travel, and they're putting more emphasis on things that are good for their health and not just recreation, uh, mental health and physical health. So those things might be generational changes to stay with us for a long period of time. Uh, if I were in a park like itself that depends heavily on cruise ships that each have 3,000 to 5,000 people in them, I might be rethinking my approach towards smaller cruise ships, toward more national visitation, trying to think about diversification away from anything that focuses on mass gatherings of large groups. Now, does this mean people are not going to continue to do those kind of things? No. In the United States, this is a holiday weekend, and we've seen scenes on TV of people not practicing social distancing at all, particularly young people who are more immune to the impacts of this disease. But I don't want to kill my grandparents, and I don't want my grandparents, to, my grandchildren to kill me. So there's a question of will this continue or not? But I do think that we have a lot to learn. We can bounce back with greater resilience. And let's not forget that we, we're dealing with a lot of other problems as well. We're dealing with climate change. We're dealing with population growth. We're dealing with massive economic injustice in many countries. So this is just one more factor on top of those we already have to deal with, or like Walter said, poaching that haven't gone away. So hang in there, everyone. And like I said, go to those links I've provided. And I think that there's a good chance that we can all come back from this stronger and more resilient in a somewhat changed world with lingering effects at least over the next 12 to 18 months that give us a chance to rethink personally and professionally what's important and update the strategies for institutional and financial stability for our protected areas. Thanks, Ray. Hey, Jim, make sure uh, when you share the links that it's shared with everyone because we don't see the links right now. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I was just going to mention, I'm not seeing the links either. So you might have uh, actually um, shared them with, uh, a, on a private chat link to one person in the group. Um, if you could just copy and paste those in and just make sure it says to everyone, then we can make sure everybody gets those links. Because these are really good resources. I mean, these resources that Jim's mentioning are just uh, basically a link to multiple resources where you can get all kinds of information that might be very helpful for some of your institutions. Um, well, thank you, Jim. Um, you know that we, I think, you know, these are really the questions, the the and the the reason we wanted to get together was just to kind of have an opportunity to check in, see how everybody's doing, see all of your wonderful faces, hear your hear your 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 positive and uplifting voices, 
and uh, just reassure ourselves that we're all in this together and that we have this network that we built uh, with the seminar that uh, we can continue to draw on if we need uh, both technical support, but also inspirational support uh, in, in just sometimes knowing that uh, you're all out there doing all the good work you're doing um, uh, is uplifting in and of itself. And um, it, was a, it was an amazing seminar year with you all. Um, I have to tell you, in the, all the years we've done the seminar, never have we had such a spectacular view of the, of the Grand Tetons after that amazing snowstorm. And even though we missed a few things because we had to uh, reroute ourselves through another unexpected state of I Idaho and, and, uh, and work our way to, back to, to Jackson Hole in a different way, uh, it was really a, an amazing seminar and, and, uh, and, and it's uh, just nice to, to check in with you all again. So um, I'm not sure if anybody has any, any last uh, parting words for this uh, opportunity to connect um, before we, uh, we sign off, but I just wanna provide another space in case there's any other final updates or, or, or information that any of you would like to share with us, with the group. I thought surely this was gonna be an opportunity for Sylvia to give us an update on the birds of Moldova, but uh, you know, maybe the birds are doing okay, even better. <laughs> Everyone, well, I just, Ryan, I, I don't know if uh, Aaron was going to give a, a final reminder, but to, uh, to everyone to be alert for the notifications about these webinars we will be doing in both English and Spanish on those aspects that Ryan mentioned. So uh, we hope to see you all online in those webinars. We're trying to choose times that would be the best for people, you know, the ones in Spanish in Latin America and the ones in English for people around the world, like at this time. So uh, we look forward to continuing to be in contact with all of you and feel free if you have any questions, uh, any particular needs, you know, we're part of a community of practice. The idea is that this never goes away. And uh, so we look forward to continuing communication with you all. And we'll be yeah. posting that information on our Facebook and sending emails to you all. So you definitely will have it and I'll, I'll throw it into the WhatsApp chat as well. And, and uh, just a note on the chat that uh, we have a positive report that the birds in Moldova are doing very well, but the internet connection is not as good. So the birds are doing better than the internet in Moldova, but we're happy to hear that. So thank you, Sylvia, for that update. <laughs> well, really good to see you all. Uh, keep up all the good work in, in all of the different corners around the world where you're doing. Hopefully keep your spirits high and uh, keep motivated and inspired to keep doing all the good work we're doing. And um, hopefully, in the near future, around the corner, there'll be some life that looks somewhat similar to four months ago, not so much like today, maybe different, but uh, at least we'll be hopefully be back in touch. We might not be doing cheek to cheek kisses like, like they do all over Latin America and other parts of the world, but uh, yeah, look at, even looking at Cristiano's face, like just the thought of going back to doing kisses, all of a sudden now we, we have like this visceral reaction to certain things. Like, I don't know if anybody's had that, but just like watching certain movies, you know, and you see people interactions in movies or on TV or something, and it, it causes you this immediate reaction. So hopefully we'll get back to uh, some new normal very soon. And in the meantime, if there's anything else we can do to help provide some support, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to, to us or our colleagues at the Forest Service. Um, we want to keep this, uh, this community of practice active. So thanks so much. And it's really, really great to see and hear from you guys. Big virtual hugs. Huge everybody. hugs. Good Thanks luck, everybody. For the opportunity. Okay. Thanks to, to join people again. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye Thanks bye. Everyone. Nice to see you. Bye bye. 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 Nice to see everybody. Bye. -bye.